Now, welcome back everyone to another one of our famous Q&A sessions. We have with us an expert panel uh, from all around the world. We just saw a presentation by Joey Julie, who joins us for this Q&A expert panel. So welcome, Joey. Uh, we Hello, have everyone. Clive Bates who, we welcome Clive Bates who uh, had already given a presentation and uh, I had the pleasure of speaking to. Now, as we said, Clive is someone who has led uh, the Action on Smoking Health in the UK and uh, as now uh, runs his own consulting firm, Counterfactual. We've down the bottom, we have David Sweener. Uh, David is an adjunct professor of law and he's also the chair of the advisory committee on the Centre for Health, Law, Policy and Ethics at the University of Ottawa in Canada. Now, he also did a whole range of things. He doesn't look uh, that old, but he has done a range of things throughout the 80s. And so he's worked in this anti-tobacco uh, fight for a very long time, including uh, a range of um, world-leading tobacco control initiatives. So great to join you, David. And we have Fiona Patton, someone who, again, is from uh, my hometown of Melbourne and is a member of the parliament here in the uh, northern metropolitan region. Now, she's the leader of the uh, Reason Party and she is uh, hailed for her work in this area, particularly around uh, harm reduction, but not just in tobacco, in a whole range of areas uh, in the policy spectrum. So welcome, Fiona. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And lastly, I go to Terry Barnes. Now, Terry's uh, an Australian again, an Australian uh, policy analyst, political commentator, and currently a fellow of the UK Institute of Economic Affairs. Uh, Terry writes extensively, um, both here in Australia and overseas, and I'm, you know, I consistently read your work, Terry. So it's great to have you here on the panel. Pleasure to be here. Now, we, given that we've got such a, uh, an impressive field of people who work in this area, um, my first question is one of, do we realistically, and this, you know, you're welcome to then answer this um, in turn, do we realistically foresee that the global opinion particularly um, in the Asia Pacific region, the global opinion will change around vaping. Uh, regulators' views, as we've heard from consumer advocates, have been fairly tough in a range of countries, particularly outright bans, um, hostility. And a lot of the questions we're getting on comments and from advocates across uh, the people watching, are how can they change views? So do we feel that realistically opinion will change. I'll, I'll go to you first, Fiona, just for the sheer fact that you're yeah. someone who works within that parliamentary process. Mm. Uh, thanks, thanks, Gavin, and, and thanks to CAFRA and um, Voices for Vape. I, I, I really, really hope so. Like, and, and sadly, it's not going to be Australia that's leading the way in this. I mean, we, we certainly, you know, I was looking at some news clips today. We're, we're celebrating that, you know, uh, vapors may get the green light to go to a doctor to get a prescription to possibly go and get some nicotine from a pharmacy. I mean, it's so ridiculous. And, you know, I, I was also reflecting on the legislation that passed in uh, Victoria in 2016, which was amendments to the Tobacco Act, which said for the purposes of this act, e-cigarettes and vaping will be considered a tobacco product. And these were even products that weren't even containing any nicotine. So I, I hope things change. I hope that actually the laws that are being uh, dis, uh, presented to us in Australia are so ridiculous that it take, it, we go back to the drawing board. But, you know, forever the optimist am I. And, and David, do you see that, given that you've got such a long history um, in this area, do you see that changing? Yeah, uh, I, I think if we look at the history of innovation, uh, mm. there, there is often very, very vicious opposition uh, to any new idea. Uh, and you do have the view that, I mean, I, I lived through the time of people saying you'd never be able to get smoking out of airplanes. Uh, you'd never be able to get warning on cigarette packs. Uh, the, the idea of, uh, of having a bar that didn't have smoking, completely impossible. Mm. Uh, but, but it's the same thing with farm mechanization or auto safety uh, or the, uh, the uh, just uh, sanitation, uh, vaccines. I mean, the, this is what happens. And I'm actually quite optimistic in that 
Innovation is a very hard thing to stop. It's particularly hard to stop now because we have the ability to share information. And we already see examples from around the world where the biggest declines we have ever seen in cigarette smoking are in countries that have uh, available alternatives. Uh, the lowest rates of smoking we see anywhere in the world are in places where people had alternatives. So it, it and we're seeing ever more examples of this. So I, I think it will happen. I mean, the, 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 the terrible part is how long it takes for the transition to, uh, to go on. Mm. Mm. Now, in terms of this, Clive, I mean, this is something which um, you would have seen from particularly UK viewpoint. And, you know, so how do you feel about that global opinion uh, changing? Look, I, I'm also optimistic. I mean, there's not much reason to be optimistic, but I am optimistic. <laughs> um, and, you know, the, re the reason is if you, if you look at where uh, the, the sort of economic vitality is in the world now it is in asia uh, to be mm. honest um, and if you look at where the enemies of innovation are located that's not not universally the case but you see it's all coming from europe from campaigners in the united states that's not to say they're not influential in asia but if you just look at the general dynamism of the societies there is an embrace of innovation to solve problems and I, I think at some point the Asian, uh, you know, we used to call them Asian tigers. I don't know if we do that anymore. But, you know, these dynamic Asian countries will throw off the messages coming from uh, ideologues and campaigners in the United States, Western Europe and so on. And they'll say, no, we are innovative societies. We embrace innovation to solve problems. And we are going to run hard with this. And whether that's in you know, the Philippines, in Hong Kong, in Indonesia, in Thailand, I see that changing quite quickly as Asian economies assert their uh, support for innovation to solve problems. Now, well, that's not happening at the moment, but I think it could turn quite quickly when they realize, you know, essentially what a neo-colonial uh, mindset sits behind this. You know, you have organizations like the union saying that um, middle income countries are so primitive that they can't even regulate these com these products and should should ban them i mean how offensive and ridiculous is that and also as if prohibitions are easy to manage anyway so i i think things could change quite quickly and that the global change may actually come from asia uh, rather than arrive there after europe and the united states and, and that's a very good point in terms of, Joey, you're on the front lines. You, you're someone who works in this all the time, and in particular in an area uh, of, the, of Asia, which uh, has had quite a back and forth around regulation, really. How do you see it uh, in terms of it, the change? Um, from, what I, uh, from what I believe, that uh, people, uh, the public perception uh, is anchored on uh, the WHO position. Uh, so, to be honest, uh, we do not see the WHO changing its position uh, in the near future. We all know where uh, motivations are, and uh, I think I'll just leave it at that. Um, what I'm happy about is that uh, day by day, more and more members of the public health community start to look at the science behind vapor products and see that they are very powerful tools um, in controlling the smoking epidemic. You know, even if we can't change the WHO position at this point, uh, winning the hearts and minds of the public is what is uh, more important to us now. Mm. And given that we see that there's a range of countries who have embraced this, there actually are population-wide measures now and population-wide data stacking up every day of every year against countries that haven't. So, you know, there is, so this is something which I think is, is very important within the region. But Terry, I'll, I'll go to you because uh, you're familiar with the changes that have just happened to Australia, and particularly we see on the comments quite a lot saying uh, a lot of countries look to Australia and New Zealand in our region as kind of beacons for policy change. So can you just like outline quickly for our audience um, what is going on in Australia and how that uh, contrasts to some of the things that is happening in New Zealand? Well, there are two things, and I think they've been raised earlier. I mean, one is the attempt to ban the importation of nicotine, uh, which has now been pushed out to the 1st of January, and I think in reality it will probably be pushed out further, if not permanently. 
and the other is, as you were alluding to before, the, the um, uh, making uh, nicotine available by prescription, uh, which is sounds great on paper, but uh, uh, I think uh, uh, the Australian Tobacco Harm Reduction Association uh, estimates that there's a grand total of eight doctors who are prepared to prescribe it, and uh, and, and uh, yeah. basically <laughs> it's almost impossible to... Yeah. Uh, to get access to it. But the other side of it, and just to take up the points that everybody else has made, is mm. I think there's another issue here, and that's generational change in the tobacco mm. control sector. I think mm. some of the uh, the more strident voices, the people that you hear about all the time and uh, are probably listening in some way to this, uh, uh, are on their way out. Uh, basically, there is a, going to be a turnover of uh, opinion leaders in tobacco control, as well as I think uh, a rush of new opinion leaders in tobacco harm reduction. And uh, I think over the next couple of years, we'll see uh, some of those people leave the stage and the pressure on, on politicians and decision makers to uh, stick to the party line as far as uh, tobacco harm reduction or tobacco control goes, I think is going to, is going to change because as the weight of evidence in favour of uh, THR builds and it's harder and harder for politicians and yeah. particularly uh, ministers making decisions to to uh, avoid the reality that this is actually something that is going to be beneficial, that is good, it is empirically tested. Um, I, I think resistance is going to crumble, but it is still a long term game. People shouldn't expect it's going to happen overnight. Yeah, well, this this is something which uh, I would like to get your opinions on an area of regulation around uh, when we talk about a gateway effect. Now, that has, is something which is raised by a lot of these um, anti-smoking organisations. The fact that vaping may then lead to some epidemic of smoking. Now, also the fact that that's combined with kind of new products, innovative products, products that I'm not familiar with, but um, the some of the disposable vapes, um, some of the uh, like puff bars, others. Now, what, do, what are your thoughts on the way in which countries are approaching regulation because it seems to me particularly listening to your presentations earlier that countries are falling into two two distinct camps one taking prohibitionist approaches and the other taking a more evidence-based approach around that mm -hmm. what are some of the ways advocates can work their way around uh, or work towards government changing their view from a prohibitionist one to one that actually is evidence-based i'll start with you david Sure. I mean, I, I think a, a really <clears throat> key part on this is people understand how regulation works. Uh, you know, the, this idea that there'll be a gateway, that if you have a low risk product, that it will somehow cause people to use a high risk product. Uh, you know, let's look at examples from history. I mean, what was it about sanitary food regulation or pharmaceutical regulation or auto safety or dealing with mm. uh, leaded petrol or leaded paint or flammable children's pajamas that, that didn't lead to people deciding they're going to do the more dangerous thing? We have the levers to use when we're, we're doing regulation and we have the ability to give honest information to people. We have the ability to have differential pricing as I wrote about in the New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago with Ken Warner and Frank Chalupka. Uh, we, we, we can set the marketplace. So what you're really saying is that we think that informed consumers would somehow decide they want to move to a product that is far, far more likely to, to harm them, that makes them yeah. stink, and that costs way more money and is less readily accessible. I mean, mm. that, 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 that would be just incredibly inept regulatory uh, drafting that any country could ever end up with that. Uh, so I, I, I don't think the people who are saying it are even serious. They're just throwing mud at a wall to see what will stick. And I, I think we're seeing that in Australia now that, it, in fact, a lot of that rhetoric about we don't know how dangerous it is or, you know, adults, it's, it, it, it'll be a gateway. Has, has kind of died down, except for the think of the children. You know, the think of the children um, mm. is now front and center. In fact, the Therapeutic Goods Authority, that was in fact their main motivation, they said, for moving uh, these products into a prescription only, it was to think of the children. And I know in the last debate, we, I, you know, one of the MPs said that, you know, this, this 14, he knew of a 14 year old who vaped and then within eight months was using marijuana. 
um, it's this kind of yeah, like that, um, yeah, the, the, the reefer madness uh, sort of approach to this has been quite extraordinary. But I, I, I get the sense, and I don't know that Terry does as well, I get the sense in Australia that, that they're less trying to rely on we don't know how safe vaping is. I think they're starting to understand that vaping is definitely going to be less harmful than tobacco product, tobacco products and combustible products. I think I think it's broadly right, but I think it's also uh, it goes back to that generational thing I was talking about before. I mean, mm. there's a whole generation of, of thought leaders and researchers who who look at the model of tobacco control in Australia and overseas and say this is the way that we made it. And, uh, vaping is basically a, such a disruption to that that they're they're running scared of it. Um, and, yeah. and 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 that they throw all you know talking about mud and yeah it certainly sticks on walls and. And because they have the reputations, they have the public standing, uh, they're the ones that ministers are run scared of. It's not the vapors. It's not, not vaping advocates. It's, it's those who are, are trying to protect their patch and trying to protect their reputations uh, when they really don't need to. I mean, because basically they can move with the times just as much as uh, anybody else can. Mm. Yes, and those. This is something which, particularly around um, regulation, I mean, I, we've seen this, and I think David's point, which is that history does, um, in a lot of ways, repeat itself, uh, because we're getting quite a lot of that. The questions from the the chat around, uh, I'm trying to deal with my local uh, local government, I'm trying to deal with my local community health, and they raise lines from the WHO, and they say, particularly like, oh, we've got to save the kids. So these, I mean, we we heard it with rock and roll. We've certainly heard it with all the other drug classes, and it's something which is important to realise that yeah. this this old what's old is new again. Now, Clive, in terms of the uh, the way in which we've seen these these kind of attitudes change, um, we we see this a lot around uh, when we're trying to prosecute these arguments in public that we we rely on you would say some anchor facts or you know a, a key line. Um, and being someone who has experience in the UK, we, we get quite a lot the the line which it, it is ninety five percent less harmful. Mm. Um, now, w why do we see that so frequently? Why, why is it that such a uh, a key line? And and and, and really, what, where does that uh, come from? Yeah. Okay. So look, I mean, the the this come the. the that number comes from two sources, really. Um, uh, the Royal College of Physicians, uh, who said that um, uh, e-cigarettes are unlikely to exceed 5% of the risk of smoking and maybe substantially lower than that. Now, that's a very carefully worded statement uh, when you say unlikely to exceed 5%, maybe substantially lower than that. So they're not saying it's 95% lower. They're just saying that's a working estimate that you can use. Public Health England said that um, you know e-cigarette use is likely to be 95% less risky than smoking okay so they're not giving precise point estimates what they're trying to do is give um, medical professionals uh, smokers vapors the public journalists a sense of roughly where the expert opinion lies on these products in terms of uh, risk and the reason they're doing this is because there is a blizzard of nonsense flowing through the media, throwing through politics, coming from unscrupulous academics who are even saying things like, you know, vaping is just as harmful as smoking. It's completely yeah. true. I mean, comp I mean, actually, the statements are getting more brazen and more outrageous mm. as time goes on. And I think they're getting more and more desperate uh, to hold on to their model, as Terry was saying, their model of tobacco control, which is, you know, punitive, restrictive, coercive, and so on. Whereas the consumer-driven model is, look, here's a different product. You might like it. Try it. Your risk will go down. Now, the basis of the at least 95% lower risk comes from some fairly straightforward ideas. Um, the basic physics and chemistry. There is no products of combustion because there's no combustion. So um, that you don't get the health effects arising from products of combustion. They come from systems toxicology, understanding what's in the what's in the vapor that's inhaled and it's much more benign than what's in cigarette smoke 
And then finally, you look at exposure. So if you if you look at what's in the, the blood, the saliva, the urine of people who are using these products, you see massively lower levels of, of toxins. So when people say, you know, we don't have we don't have, uh, you know, 40 years of data, and therefore we don't know what the long term effects are. That is a non sequitur. That is a diversionary argument because we know enough already to know that given the toxic exposures, the health risks are going to be very, very much lower. Um, and actually, you know, trying to use the precautionary principle to say, well, we just don't know, therefore we should ban it is ridiculous because we do know that if you ban these products, more people are likely to smoke and therefore more people are likely to be exposed to the much higher levels of toxins that we know arise from um, smoking and cigarettes. So it's a completely mad way of doing it. There should be no reasonable doubt about the, this. You can say at least 95%, you can say very much less risky, whatever, whatever way you wish to express it, that's the way they chose in the United Kingdom because it's a clear way of putting it across. Whatever way you choose to express it, it's very, very much less risky. And there is no real doubt about that. Mm. Mm. Do we find uh, this is something that I particularly find across the region is that, and we talked about this earlier with several presenters, is that there's a strong element uh, of, we, for want of better words, smashing the poor uh, around this because the poor are the ones who, uh, by and large, smoke the most, have spend the most income on smoking, uh, and then have some of the, the worst outcomes. And yet a lot of our public health responses are geared towards um, some of the initial things that, that made differences in developed countries. So um, what do we think about the, um, the increasing, increasingly poor returns of, uh, you know, uh, you would say tobacco taxes that are levied on consumers and particularly poor consumers, and then the perverse outcomes that we end up with um, cheap knockoff products and we end up with uh, saturation into markets where we can't control it. Is that well, me? I... Sorry, Clive, yeah, I'm going to you, Clive. Okay, well, I mean, you, you, you frame that very well. I mean, essentially there is uh, the proposition in conventional tobacco control is we will, you know, we will punish you with, you know, taxes, stigma, restrictions, coercion, and uh, we will make you suffer pain, uh, pain in the household budget. We will make you feel uh, marginalized in society. We will stop you going in the places you like to socialize. And the deal is that if you do what we ask, we will stop the pain. I'm afraid it is as brutal as that. And yet we may help you do it to some extent in a limited way. Now, I, at some point that breaks a kind of social contract you know, governments are not there to inflict pain on one part of society by smashing them with regressive taxes and stigmatizing them and so on. That That is not what governments are there to do. But if they are going to do it, and that is the norm in tobacco control, the very least they can do is make sure that they have all the options available to escape from those taxes, those, those restrictions, widening the range of options to include vaping products, smokeless tobacco products, heated tobacco products, nicotine pouches, all the things that we now see will greatly reduce the risk and can create a pathway out of smoking. And that, if they're going to behave like that, they really have to improve the helping you quit smoking side of that deal, which is for the most part, they're not doing it, especially in Australia where it's so unethical, I think it's eye-watering. And, and that's something that, David, I, I've heard you talk about before, being that if you uh, restrict access to alternative products, you entrench what is currently cigarettes. But secondly, you then uh, don't enable any action by government to um, take action on more lethal products. Yeah, uh, what we end up with is that whole... Um bootleggers and Baptist problem, that, that we have uh, this uh, a joint effort really by those who want to continue selling cigarettes, who benefit from the people who say, let's ban all the alternatives. Uh, and the people who think that they're doing good, thinking we can't get rid of cigarettes, but we'll attack these other things. And and I think one of, one of the fundamental problems here, and I'll, I'll pick up on something you said, Gavin, when you talk about public health responses, the responses from a lot of what's what's now called the tobacco control movement 
are not public health. Uh, they are completely averse to public health principles. You know, the idea of autonomy, of meeting people where they are, of understanding their lived experience, of empowering them to make better decisions about their, their own health. I mean, those are public health principles. And, and I remember trying to bring those principles into tobacco control a long time ago. And, and we were getting there. I mean, the, the idea that risk reduction was a key part of what was seen as tobacco control in the 1980s. You know, I drafted a section for a law in 1988 with no opposition from anti-tobacco people saying, of course you want less hazardous product. If you're trying to do things to motivate people to, to quit, I mean, what are you trying to do? You're trying to promote their health. So what you want to do is you want to facilitate them, empower them to do something to reduce their risks. And that means, you know, if you put up the taxes on cigarettes, for heaven's sakes, have an alternative available, like we did in moving people from leaded to unleaded mm -hmm. petrol. Uh, yeah. And I think that's the stuff we, we've got away from, where it's become this very moralistic, uh, it's treating it like it's sin, uh, that, you know, in, instead of the Enlightenment, we've got the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, and <laughs> try, try, trying to find ways to, to, get, to get past that and to call people out on it, to say, how many people are dying now because of the countries that ban things like snoots? And for the people who claim that there's no evidence that vaping is less hazardous, what do they accept on snus? I mean, here we've got in Sweden decades of use of a product by a very large number of people with loads of, of great medical data, health data. I mean, Sweden's got about the best health data in the world, and it's an incredible picture. I mean, people are using nicotine, but they're not dying from it. The, the, the disease rates for people who are long-term snooze users are basically on par with people who've never used tobacco products. How do they explain that? And in, and in most cases, what you see is that religiosity, that, that absolutism of they just refuse to accept it. They will not look, they'll dismiss it. They'll claim that, you know, they, they sound very much like any other conspiracy theorists. And, and I think calling them out on things like that is really important. Now, Joey, in terms of the Philippines where, you know, you're working there, do you find that there's a moralistic element uh, and, you know, among the attitude towards smoking? Um, right now, um, the the way they present their arguments is um, it's like a holistic approach uh, towards uh, vaping. Uh, they don't really look at the evidence. Uh, that's what we're trying to to uh, to fight for here. That's uh, for for the for the policymakers to to first look at the evidence uh, and hear us out, and uh, let's try to work on a on a a way to to strike a balance uh, with what they're, they're they're always saying about um, uh, youth use uh, epidemic, uh, but we also have to take care of uh, smokers who who need these products um, to help them. No, um, so th that's the right. Uh, we think that the right approach is uh, to convince them to. Uh, to come in with us and uh, let's uh, go strike a balance between helping smokers and uh, mm -hmm. and trying not to uh, initiate uh, people who don't uh, really smoke or mm -hmm. even the youth. Yeah. Now, Terry, I, I, I'm interested. I mean, this this is something um, in Australia we actually see um, some really interesting programs, uh, quit programs, particularly amongst disadvantaged groups, mostly uh, pregnant women, Indigenous groups. So targeted work that gives incentives for people to quit smoking. Um, yeah. That doesn't include vaping, but it does include financial incentives at times. Now, there's actually been a shift in that thinking. Is, there, is it possible that there'll be a shift in thinking to include the industries which uh, are actually driving this change? Or, or when I say driving this change and in some ways resisting this change, so uh, I think naturally of vaping industry and the actual tobacco industry itself. Terry, do you think that there's a role for them to play in this? Well, there's absolutely a role, Kevin. I mean, uh, it's actually persuading politicians, particularly ministers, that uh, they can actually talk to those industries and they can actually have a dialogue. They can actually learn things that uh, can translate to good policy. Um, at the moment in Australia, as, as you know, I mean, our approach is so prohibitionist, it's, it's not funny. I mean, we have the, yeah. the highest rate of tobacco excise in the world, but we still have a 
a smoking rate that stubbornly stuck around 12, 13 percent. And those those smokers who are determined to have their nicotine fix are going to pay whatever it takes to to, to get it. So I think mm. uh, I think the time has come. I think for I think there is another factor here, and that is when we're talking about addiction and and tobacco excise. It's actually government's addiction to revenue as much as uh, uh, trying to. Uh, to reduce the the rate of smoking and and but they they're not succeeding on on the latter while they're raking in money hand over mm. fist with former um but but my sense is again comes down to i think there's a longer game here and i think uh, some of those those walls are crumbling but to uh, to persuade a well we'll say say the australian health minister to to talk to the tobacco industry or certainly to talk to the vaping industry whether it's a, a manufacturer or retail um, without uh, being demonised and uh, by by the usual suspects uh, for for not uh, holding the line, uh, that's that's the real problem. I mean, the, while while ministers, while bureaucrats, and while why while industry leaders or, or certainly um, public health leaders are so determined to show that they're pure and that they're they're, they're politically correct on this. Those dialogues aren't going to happen, and I think the people who lose out ultimately are, are the consumers, and more particularly the disadvantaged uh, consumers that uh, you're really talking about. And Fiona, in terms of these the disadvantaged consumers which you talk about, I was shocked. I remember as a as a as a terribly um, virulent uh, anti-smoking activist in my own house against my parents, um, I was shocked to learn that the taxes were actually paid by them and not the actual tobacco industry. So. <laughs> In terms of that that social equity mm. argument, Fiona, does that cover much? Does it does it get much traction in the um, political process? It doesn't at the moment, and and I think certainly listening to the consumer group earlier, and you know, we it's easier for politicians to listen to consumers. It's easier for them to listen to them than than the the much harder, but but. Uh, equally as important conversation of having with industry. I think what we're going to see coming out of COVID and particularly in Victoria, where we've had these very significant lockdowns, we've had vape stores have been closed down for most of the year. We're actually going to see some stats coming out showing that smoking has increased and has increased specifically in the disadvantaged, uh, mm. in a lot of people from disadvantaged areas because the other thing that we've done during COVID is we've increased a lot of the welfare payments. And so we're, we're perversely going to see a, an increase in, in smoking rates. And I think maybe that can provide another catalyst and a nexus to start this conversation about, well, how do we readdress that? And what other um, I, I, innovations should we be looking at using? I. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I still I think it's difficult. I, I'm pleased in in our state of Victoria, we we've, we've got a new health minister who understands deeply harm reduction and the principles of harm reduction. So I'm somewhat buoyed that 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 may that that may help us in Victoria um, start having a better conversation about this. But we've um, yeah, I'm I'm I, I'm I'm not sure that we're we're still. Yeah, treating our, our most dis disadvantaged with the, the the care and compassion that we should. Now, just before I go to my my last uh, question, I'll just mention that there is a Zoom room. Now, these are where you can jump in. For people who are watching, uh, you can jump into the Zoom room. You'll see it just underneath our beautiful pictures here. Um, continue the conversation. Get in there. Make sure that you are asking those questions. I know there's been some superb questions um, from all across the region. In fact, all across the world. Uh, and it's been great to see so many people are watching and to hear your voices and to answer your questions. Now, I'll go to you last, David, because just talking about the industry involvement, there's been some missteps over the over the course of uh, tobacco control efforts through the 80s and 90s to involve the industry. Um, how do you see that, that uh, they could involve the industry now or at least take an approach to um, the industry involvement that would not uh, do the same as has gone before? Mm. Sure. I, I mean, I, I think the, the first step would be to actually understand the industry. Uh, we, we have a tremendous number of people who think they're doing tobacco control who are completely clueless 
about what's, what motivates the tobacco industry, what they're trying to do. Uh, and, uh, and as a result, they end up doing things that, that keep helping the cigarette business. Uh, so j just a, a remedial course on, on basic business would be important for, for many of them. I mean, to understand that one of the reasons that the cigarette industry is so reluctant to move in a rapid way toward alternative, far less deadly products is because cigarettes are so phenomenally profitable. You know, the, the profit rate that Altria makes is over twice that that even Apple makes. Uh, so why would they want to change? And it's sort of like going back to the early days of auto safety and saying, hey, I've got an idea. Why don't we ensure that the cars that are unsafe at any speed make the manufacturers $10,000 a pop and things like Volvos, you know, don't make them any money. Uh, that, that, that will get us auto safety, won't it? Uh, so I think they, they need to understand that. And I think what we need to do is take initiative to say, how would we change regulation in order to facilitate the sort of change we want to see in the market? So you don't simply go to the companies and say, please do this, when it's something that may be very much against their, their vested interests. I mean, they can look and see what's the history of uh, incumbent companies in the face of disruptive technology. Mm -hmm. And usually they, they do abysmally. Uh, mm -hmm. So you, you take the, the regulatory approach we've done on things like auto safety and food regulation and uh, uh, factory safety, uh, machinery uh, regulations, uh, what we've done in pharmaceutical regulations, what we've done in just a, a myriad of things and do that to say, here's where we want to go. And you now have a choice. You know, you can either be a Pfizer or you can be a Lydia Pinkham's vegetable compound. Which do you want to be? Uh, because this is where we want the market to go. We have the tools to cause it to happen. You now have a decision to make. And we would see a very, very rapid change. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. That's all we've got time for. Now, you can, as I said, jump into the Zoom room. Uh, it's not a cheap nightclub. It's actually a place. It's a place where you can ask questions on the web. So jump into the Zoom room. Uh, you know, you can listen to our dulcet tones again, uh, and then you can ask questions and connect with those advocates across the region. So thank you, Clive. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Joey. Thank you, David. Thank, thank you, Fiona, for your participation tonight. No way. All right. Thanks.